see if this is on. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Judy Gradwell, President and CEO here at the San Diego Natural History Museum, and we are absolutely thrilled that you're joining us tonight for what promises to be an absolutely wonderful talk about some really incredible parts of uh, Southern California. And uh, while we're thinking about the natural beauty of California, I wanted to acknowledge the and pay our respects to the indigenous tribes who were the traditional stewards of the land. And specifically, we recognize the Kumeyaay people whose on whose ancestral homelands the museum sits. It, as the original caretakers and conservationists, we honor their continued legacy of understanding, caretaking, and upholding the pillars of biodiversity. We all know that we live in an extraordinary place. You may not know, however, that San Diego County ha is the most biodiverse county in the contiguous uh, 48 states. So uh, we are in a truly amazing area, world-class biodiversity. And uh, the sad part of that story is we've already lost about 60% of the original habitat. So we are... We are all caretakers of a disappearing um, and, and quite, quite a spectacular resource. So um, it's really exciting to hear about what's going on in the parks. And uh, there has never been a more critical time for us all to be focusing on areas that are also not protected at this point. Here at the NAT, we've been a quiet but effective force for nature in our region for nearly 149 years. Yeah, next year is our 150th anniversary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we were founded by a group of amateur naturalists in 1874. Four guys got together. Um, very Victorian story. They all had collections that they wanted to share and trade and, and talk about. And it's, that's basically how a lot of natural history museums got started. But this is only about, I, I believe, a dozen years after uh, Origin of Species was published. It's, it's, it's uh, very early in California, definitely early in this part of the world. And we've been working steadily since then to document and study the, our region. And our scientists are among the greatest experts about uh, what lives here and what has lived here, and uh, both in San Diego and across the border all the way to the tip of Baja. Every day our scientists are identifying new species, unlocking the relationships between plants and animals, and using science to conserve threatened and endangered species. In the coming years, you'll, be hear, you'll hear us uh, be a stronger and louder voice uh, and an active player to help preserve our natural world, because this severe habitat uh, loss that I mentioned earlier happened on our watch. And so it's time for us all to um, band together and... Uh, and the, a lot of the development helped make San Diego the world-class city that it is today, but it's also time to preserve what we have left. Before, just before the program, I just have a few reminders for everyone. First of all, emergency exits are behind me and behind you. And while we do ask that you silence your cell phones, we encourage you to continue tonight's conversation on social media using hashtag NatTalk. This season of Nat Talks was made possible by presenting sponsor the Downing Family Foundation and our media partner, KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial Counties. And tonight we're going to explore the many stories that a decade's worth of data can tell us about nature, um, some of which are tales of warning, others of hope and optimism. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Keith Lombardo, who is a coastal ecologist and director of the Southern Research Learning Center. Keith received his BS degree in natural resource management from the University of Connecticut and a PhD in geography from University of Arizona. And his dissertation research focused on the reconstruction of historic chaparral fire regimes in Southern California. Very timely topic. In his current role, he's charged with facilitating cross-cutting scientific partnerships, um, engaging the public in scientific exploration and communicating the science that supports our stewardship of three uniquely Southern California national parks, the Cabrillo National Monument, Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, and Channel Islands National Park. 
Keith's current research areas are wide-ranging and include topics such as coastal ecology, genetic conservation, and ecosystem responses to climate change. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Keith Lombardo. Thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Natural History Museum, for having me, and thank you all for coming. And so I was asked to talk about the National Park Service because tomorrow is our 107th birthday. So, uh, yeah, all right, congratulations for making it there. Um, and so what I really want to focus on tonight is, is the really cool science that's going on in our three Southern California national parks. So with that, let's get into our three parks and our three stories. So first, just an overview of where we're going to go tonight. So you'll hear a little, about, a little bit about who I am. I, uh, you heard a bit about my academic background and, and my professional experience. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a really high-level view of the Park Service uh, and really think about our mission, because that's kind of important when, we, uh, when you hear this talk tonight. Uh, then we'll dive a little deeper and talk about research learning centers, of which I'm the director of one. Uh, and then we'll get into our three parks and three stories. So who am I? What am I doing up here? Well, uh, again, I have my PhD from the University of Arizona, where I studied uh, dendrochronology. So I, I reconstructed uh, historic fire regimes in Southern California. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, it's akin to winning the lottery. I got a full-time permanent position with the Park Service right out of grad school. It just doesn't happen that way. I was just very, very fortunate. Uh, so I spent a few years as a terrestrial biologist there. Uh, doing vegetation monitoring and restoration work. And uh, after a couple of years, I was promoted to the chief of natural resources. And so that oversees all of the, of the uh, you know, research programs and monitoring programs within the park. And then four or five years ago, I was uh, fortunate enough to get this position as director of the Southern California Research Learning Center, which is part of the National Park Service. Uh, and as you can see, my focus is kind of, it's all over the place, right? I'm a fire ecologist who works in the water. Not sure how that worked out, but, but it did, right? I'm here. So a little bit about the Park Service, right? So we're on the eve of our 107th uh, birthday, right? And so that's the founding of the service. So that's the, the overarching umbrella of which we manage all of our parks. Uh, and that's where the mission was born in, in 1916. But there are actually national parks that are older than the service. So, for example, Yellowstone National Park, 1872. Sequoia in Yosemite, 1890. And our own Cabrillo National Monument in 1913. So three years older than the service itself. Uh, but born out of that, and the Organic Act was when uh, with birthed the Park Service, right? There's the mission was born as well. And I'll read it to you, right? It's the National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, inspiration for this and future generations, right? So it's a really big statement, and we're going to come back to it in a minute. And so when you think about national parks, right, I think our minds tend to go to these places, right? Death Valley, Yosemite, Yellowstone, right? And for a reason, right? They're national park units because they're the gem of our, our system, right? There's these magnificent landscapes with the magnificent ecologies uh, and, you know, they deserve it of the national park label. But there are lots of smaller parks out there that are national parks for a reason, like Mesa Verde and Fossil Butte and Buck Island, right? Things you never really hear of, but there, there's a reason why they're national parks, but then we also have our historic parks, right? The Lincoln Memorial, the President's Park, which is the White House, and the Statue of Liberty. Those are all National Park Service properties and under our care. And then we have our, our historic military parks, like Gettysburg and Valor, War in the Pacific, which is the Pearl Harbor site. So if you put all those together, there's 425 currently units in the Park Service, right? And you put all those together... It's a huge mission, right? The scope is huge. It's not just, you know, Yosemites and Yellowstones. It's all of these parks, and the scope is, is really pretty incredible. And if we revisit the mission statement that we just read, right, and you can see the bolded and underlined statements, right, it's to preserve unimpaired, meaning we need to keep it in the most pristine condition possible, right, for the enjoyment, right, so, that's, so that folks like us can actually go out in the parks and enjoy them and walk around and explore, for this and future generations, so now and forever. So 425 park units, a diversity of, of resources, and then uh, put this mission on top of it, that's huge, right? It's a really, really huge burden uh, on the Park Service. But, you know, we do it lovingly. Like, if you meet anybody from the Park Service, they all love their job because they all love the mission, right? So, but it's, it's not without its challenges. 
And so I'm going to zoom in on resource management, natural resource management, because that's, that's my world, right? And you see this graphic here, and this is how I like to think of resource management in a park, right? There's, there's the resource managers like Lauren Pandori is here tonight, right? So their job is to every day make sure, you know, monitoring is getting done, that resources aren't impaired, that, you know, visitors aren't, you know, destroying resources, but enjoying them, right? And so Lauren needs lots of tools, right? She needs data from our inventory and monitoring programs, and the park service, let me say, is really, really good at inventory monitoring, right? Understanding what is there and how it's changing. We have lots of good data. We're very good at that. Um, and so that's, that's something that feeds into uh, Lauren's ability to, to manage things, right? Um, and just to kind of give you a quick overview of what, what inventory monitoring looks like, right? It's, it's nationwide. It's in uh, multiple park units, right? And, and, it's, and it's uniform within biogeographic areas. So you'll see tonight, like, right, we're in the Southern California, the Mediterranean network, because our parks are similar. We have similar methodologies. Uh, and this is a really important part of, of uh, the data that's used to manage national parks. But that's just, that's just uh, resource management and inventory are just two of the three legs of our, our stool that supports our stewardship, right? And the last one is science. And that's really where research learning centers come into play. A lot of staff in the Park Service um, aren't, they, they aren't scientists or you don't have the capacity to do science, right? Resource management and monitoring is a little bit different than your kind of everyday scientific inquiry, right? And so that's, we don't have that built into the Park Service except really into the RLCs. And so that's a really important role is we're this third leg here. And so that's where I come in and other RLC directors come in across the country. And Unfortunately, I'm not out in the field or in the lab doing science every day. You know, I tell people I make emails, essentially, is what I do. It's what I produce. But I'm really involved in this part, the facilitation, right? The Getting the inventory and monitoring data to scientists who can then answer questions to feed that data to Lauren, who can then make a decision to maybe change inventory and monitoring, right? And just kind of facilitating these, these three parts uh, working smoothly. So that's really the role that I serve as director of the RLC. So what are RLCs, right? There are 18 across the country, and you know, we talked about there's these little biogeographic networks of parks. Each one has an RLC. But our RLCs have the same four common goals. And the first is to promote national parks as a premier place for scientific inquiry, right? And so that, think of that as like it's me going out to academics and, and uh, institutions like the NAT and saying, hey, look at what we have here. We have these incredible natural laboratories. We have these really long-term data sets don't you want to come into the park and, and use it for your research, right? The second is to facilitate and promote the use of science to make resource management decisions. It's, a very, it's similar to number one, but it's sort of the opposite direction of a two-way street, right? Now, this may be a situation where um, a manager has a question, but we don't have the in-house expertise or the capacity or the funding to address it. Then it's my job to reach out to that academic community and say, hey, we need your help to solve this issue. Right, so it's sort of two sides of the same coins, and there's number one and two. The third is to improve science literacy by incorporating science into the staff experience. Right, and so that's it's science communication. It's this tonight, right? It's me here talking about the really cool science that's being done in our parks. Uh, it's about engaging visitors in the park, uh, but it's also about engaging our own staff. When I started the park service, I assumed everyone was a biologist, right? It's not true. It's a very small sliver of us are actually biologists. There's a lot of administrators. There's a lot of facilities folks, law enforcement, right? And so they have some background and interest, obviously, right? They're in the park service. You would think they would. But a lot of times they don't know what that researcher there is doing. And they're often the ones you see in the field. You don't see me in the fields. I'm either at home making emails or I'm in the inner title somewhere where you can't get me, right? So you run into people in the field who are just, you know, fixing trails or cleaning up the garbage. And it's really important that they understand the science and the resources in the park as well. So it's an important part of this mission. And finally, the last one is really kind of a self-evaluation to assess our activities, are they effective? But I really like this part that's adapting to achieve the vision because it allows me to be really flexible and to pivot uh, on when emerging issues uh, pop up, right? So a lot of times, you know, um, the park manager, will, something will happen, and they'll say, man, we really need to understand what's, what is causing this change in our park. And they say, that's great. We, our funding's two years out now. In three years, I can give you some funding to figure that out. And resource manager's like, well, I need it now, right? And so because I have this flexibility, perhaps I can step in and say, hey, let me, let me pass some money to university. Let's get a student on this. And maybe it's only a pilot project, but it gets us to a place in two, three years when that funding comes in. 
that we're ready to hit the ground running and we already know where we want to go with that. So it's an important part of this mission. Uh, just to show you here the, um, the, where the RLCs are located, you can see each green dot is an RLC throughout the, the country, and they're all embedded within a different park unit. And then zooming in to where we are today, right? So the Mediterranean Network, that's our, our network of three Southern California parks. And you can see Santa Monica Mountains here, uh, headquartered in Thousand Oaks. Channel Islands National Park, which is uh, headquartered out of Ventura. And here in San Diego, Cabrillo National Monument. So that gives you sort of the overview, right? So a little bit about RLCs and the park service and where we're going to focus tonight in Southern California. And so this, with that, let's get into three parks and three stories. And we're going to start farthest away on the Channel Islands, right? A really, really amazing place. If you've not been to the Channel Islands, I highly recommend going. It's What I love is that where in Southern California can you go and not see another person, right? Not many places. Well, so, well, the Channel Islands are a plan chance to be on a beach where you see nobody. Um, so I'd highly recommend uh, if you can get out to the islands someday. And so in the white box, you can see the four northern islands, right? Anacapa, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and, uh, and San Miguel. And that little dot uh, in between uh, Nicholas and Catalina is, is Santa Barbara Island, and that's the fifth. So five of the islands are owned by the Park Service and managed by the Park Service. And the other graphic is just to give you some context, some deep historical context. About twelve to 10,000 years ago, those four northern islands were actually one island, right? Their sea level was lower. All those islands were connected, and it was much closer to the mainland. So it allowed Native Americans to access the islands a lot. And so there's a lot of really incredible um, uh, ethnographic and archaeological history on the islands from Native American use. It's really a, a fantastic story in and of itself, right? That should be a, a great talk here. Um, but just to kind of dice, I bring this up just so you get a sense of like, okay, there's, there's been people on these islands and, and, and activities on these islands for quite some time. Uh, and some of them have changed the landscape in that time. For example, we believe the island fox, which is the top predator in the island and the thing that everybody wants to see when they come to the Channel Islands, uh, we think it was brought to the islands by Native Americans five to 6,000 years ago, right? And so you can imagine, you know, it was much easier to get across the channel to the bring and to bring these, the, you know, at the time, domestic companions over with them, right? And then they spread across the islands, and as the islands became from one to four, each island, the fox on, became speciated. So we have like the San Miguel Island fox, the Santa Cruz Island fox, and Rose Island fox, and so on. But all that said, nothing changed the islands more than what has happened in the past, say, 150 years in the ranching era. Right, so you know, mid 1800s, the all of the islands were basically ranches, right? And many, many livestock were brought on cattle and and, and sheep and goat in particular. Uh, and and this is actually into our fairly recent past. So that image in the middle is 1990. That's Santa Cruz Islands, and you can see how many cattle are just in one spot there, right? And you can look at all these photos and just you you notice, right? There's very little vegetation, right? And if you bring a a whole lot of grazers to an, an island that's never had grazing on it. It's, it, gets, it gets hammered pretty quickly, and that's what happened. Within, you know, 40, 50 years, the island was denuded, right? And, and what replaced all these uh, native shrublands were native grasslands. Or, I'm uh, sorry, non-native grasslands. All right, here's Christy Ranch out in Santa Cruz Island, and you could see um, – at these, it's particularly on like the coastal uh, slopes and any mesa top that was relatively accessible it was basically grazed down to nothing and replaced with non-native grasses. And honestly, it's going to be really, really, really hard to ever have anything but that short of, you know, a massive change in our climate and, you know, that that, that would bring its own issues anyway. But so anyway, these low these low elevation areas and these coastal mesas were are, have been completely changed into non-native grasslands. But at the higher elevations, right, which may be a little harder to reach, they were still grazed, but maybe a little harder to reach and maybe a little more resilient. You see in this image here a, an image of a, an island oak, right? And so what happened here in, in, at the higher elevations, right, here's – this is Santa Rosa Island. Um, you could see, right, you, some of these oaks, right, you can see the root structure coming down, and that's because we've lost, we think we've lost four to five feet of topsoil, so, right, this, imagine, right, you know, close your eyes and imagine that these were you know, much bigger oak canopies, many more oaks in between, and then all connected by a chaparral like the Santa Rosa Island Manzanita. So these were just continuous, basically, shrublands on these ridgelines, 
uh, and they were really great at catching fog, and there's these really rich systems. Now, if you graze out all of those manzanita, right, and leave all this kind of just exposed topsoil, this is an area that gets a lot of rain, a lot of wind. It just erodes really quickly. And in this, what you're looking at here, this is, it's actually bedrock. There's really nothing there other than bedrock. And so these kind of sentinel oaks are just left, you know, hanging on, uh, and we don't really see a lot of recruitment. So it's a really difficult landscape to restore, right, when your job is to preserve something unimpaired. How, how do you repair that? And this is, you know, off the uh, uh, Santa Cruz Island again, and you can see the fog, right? Fog's just a huge input of moisture for the island, and it drove a lot of the ecologies, like those, those coastal ridgelines are all just fog-fed, right? And I'll show you some really great pictures in a moment of what it looks like underneath these, uh, some of the, the functional cloud forests that remain. Yeah, here's one here. So, right, this is underneath a cloud forest, right? This is where you get like seven, eight, nine, ten oaks all still connected in this big space, right? And they're catching all this fog that's rolling up the coastal slopes. And you could just see how green and lush it is under these under these oaks, right? And it drives this whole ecosystem underneath the oaks. And and these are actually in really quite good shape. There's no non uh, no non native species uh, in these areas. And I really like this picture because you can really kind of get a sense uh, uh, if, you're, if your eye is keen here, right? So this is, this is an oak, right? It's catching all this fog. And it's literally, you're under there and it's just raining on you. It's just raining rain. It's like Seattle. It's just constant drizzle and mist. And it's, it's really fantastic. And you can see that there's lots of lichens and moss and other shrubs growing underneath the canopy of these oaks. And then you can see down here in this, this corner, this little kind of light brown patch, that's where the, the canopy ends and the fog drip stops. And it's just bare soil again, right? But underneath that canopy, we have leaf litter, we have soil forming. So it's it's super important that we're able to like you know keep these systems connected uh, to be able to get them to thrive and 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 grow. And so, how do you do that, right? When you have when you're left with a handful of sentinel oaks uh, and barren rock and lots of space in between these oaks, right? Well, we've tried lots of things, and and what you're seeing here are uh, like three or four different projects. You can see these the, the wattles here on the on the left side. Those are these these uh, like coconut mats that are meant to catch soil from running off. So we're trying to keep as much soil as we can uh, up against these trees. You can see the drip irrigation line. We tried drip irrigation. You can see the PVC tube that's for like deep watering into roots. Uh, but the project I love most are these fence, these little mesh fences, and that's mimicking like a canopy, right? So when the moisture and the fog blows over these areas, it, it condenses onto that mesh. Uh, canopy and it just dribbles down into the plant and this is not a good this is a very recent planting uh but you'll see other ones that are like you know five ten years old and they're full-on shrubs and, and underneath those shrubs are other smaller shrubs so it's working it's just a it's a slow process right and so I mentioned the Santa Rosa Island manzanita, right? So this, on Santa Rosa Island, it was, it was a dominant uh, species on those ridge lines that connected all of these oak uh, cloud forests together. And, and there are similar manzanitas on the other islands that do the same thing. And this, this data, this is from the long-term uh, monitoring program. Uh, you can see it starts in 1990, right down here. So very little manzanita in 1990, right? It's still being grazed in 1990, so not surprising. Uh, and it took us about 10 years or so, or maybe a little more, to remove all the grazers from the area. Uh, and you can see that kind of hash mark line in the year 2000. And then look at the, the growth, right? After we moved the, the grazers, look at the growth of manzanita. And that's not restoration process. That's just manzanita that was there surviving and just being grazed every year but surviving and then released from grazing pressure, and it just grew, right? So um, this, there's, like, really good potential for passive restoration, and just to give you a sense of what it looked like, so 1999 in that inset photo, uh, and then 2022 in the larger photo, you're looking at the same, this is the same direction, this photo taken from the same point. And in 1999, you can see there's not much there. There's a little bit of green in the middle. That's this massive manzanita that's kind of swallowing up Cameron right now as he's, as he's measuring, uh, doing his long-term vegetation monitoring. So it, a lot of really good growth in 20 years, right? And that's just, that's just one spot that's happening in many places. And so when you have that passive restoration, right, just releasing these, these uh, species from grazing, and then you couple that with active restoration, right, you could see, like, okay, there's potential here, right? It's, the island, the scale of it is huge, right? How do you scale up these? That's a, that's a real challenge for sure. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the approach we're taking, and, it, and it's working. We just need time. 
and and we're really hopeful because um, because there's there's concrete examples on the islands of this happening. Uh, you can see in the black and white photo, right? They have Santa Rosa Island, you know, completely denuded aside from a you know a handful of of oaks, uh, and then the color images. These are from Santa Cruz Island. And Santa Cruz Island is 75% of it is owned by the Nature Conservancy and 25% by the Park Service. And uh, the Nature, Nature Conservancy and the Park Service kind of took management of the islands at the same time. Uh, and it was immediately recognized, like, we've got to get rid of grazers. Uh, but, you know, the Park Service being a government entity needs to go through a lot of public review and environmental processes to say, like, hey, we just want to kill everything that's non-native on the islands and get it out of here. You imagine like the public backlash, right? There's book, been books written about it, you know, about the public backlash to that effort. But the Nature Conservancy being an NGO and a private organization can just say, hey, it's our property. We're getting rid of the cattle, right? And we're getting rid of the goats. And so they had a good 10 to 15 year head start. But you can see, I mean, look how wonderful this looks, right? It's Santa Cruz Island on the Nature Conservancy side is, is a really an inspiration for the Park Service to know like, okay, if we just have a little more time, right, and a little more effort, we can get there. Right, so it's really encouraging for me as a scientist to see this. And then there's other really cool projects that are going on too, looking at novel ways that we can uh, expand our restoration efforts. Right, there's a group from the Smithsonian Institute and UC Santa Barbara Smithsonian Scholars Program, where they're they're studying scrub island scrub jays, right? and island scrub jays love oak acorns, right? And they'll take a, an individual will, will stash hundreds of acorns a year. Right, and they're really good about where they stash them. They'll remember about where they stash about eighty percent, but there's twenty percent they kind of forget about. And so, what this group is doing is studying how many they're taking and where they're stashing them. They GPS all the stashes, and then they figure out, okay, well, here's the eighty percent the bird remembered, but here's the twenty percent that were left behind. What percent of that is then you know becoming from an oak, uh, from an acorn to a sapling to a tree, right? And so. They're trying to understand, can we actually use scrub jays as little ecosystem engineers, right? Can we spread oaks, right? Because oaks are super important in the system. So can we use them as ecosystem engineers? So, again, coupling that with the other efforts, right, you, you, you're slowly putting the pieces back together. And so, you know, when we think about the Channel Islands, right, it's – to me, what's really important is it's you're, we're rebuilding a system and we're watching it grow, and, and it's, it's never going to be exactly what it was, right? It's, it's going to be a little different given that's coming from you know, a, a, a novel state. We have a novel climate influencing it. So it's really important that we keep collecting data, but it's really important that we keep working with people. Like this is Catherine McEachern in there holding that photo. Catherine's been working in the cloud forest for 30 years, right? All of these projects I'm showing you at the cloud forest are, are her babies, right? It takes someone like that, 30 years of research for the USGS, right, to really drive these programs. And she's an integral part of what, of what we're doing at the Park Service to restore Santa Rosa Island. As Smithsonian scholars and Smithsonian Institute, you know, understand these novel interactions with scrub jays. You know, it's Cameron in the field collecting data for months on an end, right? So it's super, these partnerships that are internal and external are really, really what drive our, our ability to actually attempt to even restore this ecosystem. Okay, let's go to the mainland now, right? So we're flying east. We're, uh, we're in the mainland north of uh, Los Angeles. And the thing about Santa Monica Mountains that I, I really uh, loved and, and I'm always kind of bewildered by is that there are some areas you can walk in that – so I said, like, you got to go to the Channel Islands to be alone. It's not true. Actually, there's some areas in the Santa Monica Mountains that are, are incredibly remote and, and pristine, and it's, it's mind-blowing that it's still there. Because you can come over a ridge line and see the city of 20 million people right there, so the juxtaposition of like that urban and and wild wildland is just it's this it's got to be the starkest in the country, right? And the thing that really drives uh, the dynamics in this park are are these two things here, right? Roads and the cars that drive on them, right? There's just a lot of roads and a lot of cars and a lot of people. Here's a map. Uh, so the Santa Monica Mountains are. You know, this is sort of the Santa Monica Mountains right here. And you can see the 101, the 1, the 405, the 5. And in that, and within that, there's so many different little roads and, and, and state roads, right? It's, it, it's really, really a fragmented uh, landscape. Yet, despite all that, there's mountain lions, there's black bear, there's bobcats, there's coyotes, right? And, and relatively healthy populations uh, of these species. So that, that to me is amazing, Right. City of 20 million people, you can still see a, a mountain lion. 
But that said, there's also lots of really important smaller species that maybe we don't think about, like the California newt, and the western fence lizard, and the California red-legged frog. But to tell the story of Los Angeles is really – it's best told through the mountain lion, right? Because we all love mountain lions. It's an amazing story. And and these two guys uh, on the on the left here uh, have, have done a really good job of understanding mountain lion dynamics in, in the Santa Monica Mountains. They've been capturing collaring lions for more than 20 years now. And essentially every lion for the past 20 years that's stepped foot in the Santa Monica Mountains has a collar on it now. And, and we understand you know where that species – where that individual came from. Uh, how healthy it is, where it's moving. And I'd like to tell you that this is a Jackson Pollock painting laid over the over a, a map of Los Angeles, but it's not. It is uh, each of the colors is a, an individual mountain lion, right? And uh, so you can start to see like the different colors are where the mountain where a particular mountain lion is moving. So that these colors are GPS units, right? And every hour or so, it sends up a ping to a satellite. Says, "Hey, I'm here." Ping. Hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. You do that long enough, you start to see like, okay, so P5 really likes to live on the eastern portion, but P10 is trying to cross the 101 in this, this area, right? So we get a really good sense of where they want to be and where they want to go. And then from that, you can start to understand their home ranges, right? Over years, you start to see lions inhabiting the same locations. And again, right here is the Santa Monica Mountains right here. Uh, and then all these lines are, are just kind of home ranges. And, you know, our, our team at Santa Monica Mountains believes that it's maybe big enough for one lion. Like if ideally, like that'd be a good space for a single lion. But you can see here there's like six or seven or eight lions in one space. Right. And that's that's really tough. Right. Lions do not like to be near each other. All right. Um, so they're and they're hemmed in. Right. They can't really leave because of the 101 and the five and, the you know, all the roads that are, are bisecting the, the range. And so when you get these animals who aren't able to travel freely, right, they, there's lots of genetic problems, right? And so that's, that was the first thing we realized we really need to understand is what are we working with in terms of a genetic uh, pool and genetic diversity. Uh, and so when we capture and collar lions, you know, we also give them a health check and we also draw blood. Uh, and from all that uh, material, we can gather their genetic material and kind of understand a little bit more their genetic past and then use that data to understand what's going on into the future. And, uh, microsatellite genetic markers are really interesting in that you can almost see changes from generation to generation. So you can get, kind of get really quick data to understand what's happening uh, to the population. And uh, I'll just kind of explain this graph. It's not as scary as it looks. Uh, this the big green patch here on the on the uh, the left. That's south of the 101. So that's that's a lot of the mountain, a lot of the Santa Monica Mountains, but south of 101. Right, and then the middle is west of the five, and then the red is east of the five. So these are like major, like major interstates. There are absolute hard barriers, essentially, for these animals to move. Uh, and then the colors are, are are genetic makeup and structure. Right, so ideally, you would have like a lot of green, a lot of blue, and a lot of red. Right, if you saw that in all three, you'd be like, oh, they're they're mixing. Right, this is great. We have great genetic diversity and, and, and mixing. But you don't see that, right? Particularly south of the 101, and what that solid color of green means is like, essentially any any lion that's living south of the 101 is probably related to the other lion that's living there, right? And you do that long enough, it's it's just a downward spiral, right? You can, and you can't really pull out of that. And it's not just mountain lions; it's bobcats. So these three colors represent uh, not home ranges of a single individual, but say you know a small group of individuals. Uh, so in the red, in the blue, and the green, right? And you can see the major, right? here's the 101, and here's even Canaan Road, which is a fairly large residential road. But even that's enough to divide a population into two, right? And then the numbers are just uh, uh, statistical significance indicating that, you know, those that live in the red are different. Their genetic material is different than the ones in the blue, which is different from green, which is different from red, right? So essentially you've taken this one area where probably many bobcats were intermingling over, you know, in 100 years ago, right? And now they're being divided into smaller and smaller groups and they're just in, you know, inbreeding, right? And it's, it's coyotes, the same story, right? Is it telling you the exact same thing you just saw again, that it's happening with coyotes as well. So it's obviously, right, this fragmentation driven by roads and people and development is huge, right? And it's changing the geography and the ecologies of, of, of the Santa Monica Mountains. 
And so this graph here is it's it's really really important. Um, so let me walk you through it quickly. So the first thing you see is that red line, right? That really stands out. And what that is, that is the level of genetic diversity in Florida panthers when we realize essentially they're extinct, right? They're still there today, but we had to bring in cougars and panthers from other parts of the country to bring that genetic, literally to bring the genetic material to the panthers, right? And hybridize them just to keep, just to keep a population going. So there's no more pure Florida panthers. So we don't want to hit that red line, right? Um, and then you'll see uh, the blue line represents. So, sorry, let me hear. This is a, this is time, right? We're about here. This is genetic diversity. Let's call it right. And so we're about here. And you see this in this scenario. This is no immigration. So this is every line is staying exactly where they are. No one's moving. No one's going to other territories anymore, right? And you can see it under that scenario, right? That this we hit this red line in 40 years. But if you th think about the variability, right? We think it's this, but it could be this. Anywhere between the next 20 to 40 years, like mountain lions are, are extinct from the Santa Monica Mountains, right? That's just kind of, it's a scary thought. Um, but fortunately, we're not there, right? We are here. We get about one new line every 12 years. So one line somehow crosses the 101 or, or the 405, right? Um, it's pretty amazing in and of itself. Um, but you'll see, even in this scenario, right? You know, in 50 years, we're there. But in this variability, maybe it's 20 or 40 years. So it's not that much different from no migration, right? It's, it's very, it, we're, it's, we're trending very close to that. So under the current scenario, we're worried. We're, we're pretty sure like mountain lions are going to go extinct. And Seth Riley, who's the uh, main biologist, you know, really thinks that like this is overly optimistic that he thinks they've got about 20 years, right? So, but then let, let's, let's not go down that hole of doom and gloom, right? What about if we got one every four years, right? So now look at this blue line. It's it's well above the red, and you know maybe maybe we're here, but yeah, that's a little more encouraging. And if we can get one every two years, well, we're almost out of out of the trouble, right? So there's hope, right? And this is really important information, and and this was the information that really helped us win over folks for this project, which is the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing, right? Yeah, it's super exciting, and it's under it's underway. If you drive through the Liberty Canyon now, you'll see it being built. Uh, estimated to be finished at the end of 2025, um, and it connects two really large er natural areas. Right, it's it's actually two really good spots uh, to put the bridge, and we also put it there because that's where lions go all the time. They they're in this big open space. They see the other one, you know, and it's it's like a it's a relatively like low traffic area of the 101. It's still a crazy 101, but um, so we know lions want to cross there. So we're really confident that they're going to use this overpass. But it's not just lions that'll use it. Coyotes will use it. Black bears will use it. You know, bobcats, quail. We're hoping that like this really can open up a lot more uh, genetic flow from into the into the Santa Monica Mountains. So maybe you are going to get one every four or lion every four years, or even every two years, right? And that could potentially save the population. But it's just that's just one spot, right? So it's like uh, it's somewhere like right in here this is where the crossing is. Right, so they can cross here and get into the Simi Hills. That's great. And there's lions in the Santa Su Susanas, but the richest population is here in the Los Padres, right? It's a really healthy, large population. We really want this to happen. We want lions to be doing this. So we probably, yeah, we'll get one here, but we probably need one here and here and here, right? So we need, like, more. We need, like, five to ten wildlife crossings. But we're really confident that once, once people start to see the success of this one, that'll be easier to build future ones. Uh, and a lot of, there's a lot of money out there. And when they, when you redo a highway and you widen it, or uh, there's always money that comes to wildlife and the park is really good at about getting that money. So we really think we can actually, you know, put two or three more in, in the next, you know, decade or so. So that, that's mountain lions, right? Charismatic megafauna. Who, who doesn't love that? But there's so many other little stories that you can tell of smaller species. Uh, and this is one I think is a really interesting story about the western fence lizard and the side blotch lizard. And so if you wander through the Santa Monica Mountains, right, you see a lot of this kind of habitat. Um, and in the, the background there, you see some nice oaks and a and, uh, shrub uh, Understory, and this would be a really, really good spot place to find a lizard. Maybe not so much in that mustard forest in the foreground, but in that background, it looks great. Uh, and there's probably lots of lizards in there. But this is typically what you see in the in the Santa Monica Mountains. This is right, kind of semi-degraded natural habitat, but it's open space. It's not bad. 
and then a housing development, and then some like degraded habitat, and then really good habitat. So that's really common in the Santa Monica Mountains. And uh, before we look at the graph, I want you to look at the image here, right? This is called a pitfall trap, and these are used to capture uh, uh, lizards in particular. Uh, and they're really effective at catching lizards. And if you do this long enough in enough spaces, you can start to figure out like, you know, what you're catching, how many of those you're catching, you know, what's their sex, their size, right? So you can really get a good understanding of, of uh, your herpetofauna wildlife. And then so in this, this image here, you see each of the pies is a pitfall trap, right? And then, and then the color is representative of the species. So, right, so blue is western fence and red is the side blotched. And then you'll see some, you'll see some uh, letters next to the pie charts, and, and they just mean this, right? The C is like the most natural area. Those are in areas that are like really pretty good open spaces in really good shape. The L is a mix, right? It's, it's pretty good space, but it, there's definitely some like urban development nearby. And the S are really small open spaces, essentially like embedded within an urban uh, matrix. And what you can see is, right, that the species are starting to kind of sort out, right? They're finding their niche, right? The western fence lizards, they like these big open spaces, but the, um, the side blotch doesn't mind living in these urban development areas, right? Um, and so that's – it's okay, right? They're there, um, and, you know, but you think about in the past before there were roads and houses, right, these species would probably be, you know, kind of intermixed across the landscape, uh, uh, but now you're starting to see them kind of driven into into smaller and smaller areas and more and, and unique uh, habitat niches. But it's not it's not all bad, right? So this graph uh, I'll, is it's pretty simple, right? So this is size, right? This is a small area. This is a large area. This is diversity. This is low diversity. This is high diversity. And what this this line is showing you is sort of the uh, no duh, right? The more space you have, the more diversity you have. Uh, the less space you have, the less diversity you're going to have. But what it's also showing you is that even at this level of diversity of like a 1.0 on this index is not bad, right? It's not, not a bad situation to be in. So even these, these, these species are living in essentially an urban area. There's still a lot of diversity occurring in that area. So it's encouraging that it's persisting, right? And so kind of thinking about the Santa Monica Mountains, right? We have all the people, all the roads, all the cars, right? And we still have all the mega, but we still have, you know, the coyotes and the, and the mountain lions, and we have this really cool, you know, the California newt and western fence lizard, right? All juxtaposed uh, against each other. But what makes this really complicated, right? You see this green outline? That's, that's the official Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. The dark green, like this, that's Park Service property. Everything else that is not dark green there is either state land, like state park, land trust, and then a lot of private inholdings, right, and lots of roads. So, and then on top of that, this is a really complex landscape. You know, mountains rising out of the sea, incredibly steep canyons and you know, high ridge lines. If you layer all it over, it becomes an incredibly complex landscape to manage, right? Uh, so you have, you know, all these you know, these drivers of, of change, and then you're trying to manage the diversity of species from mountain lions down to California newts, and then do it with a variety of partners. It becomes really complex really quickly, right? And so... Thinking back again, right, so how do you do that? Especially in Santa Monica Mountains, it requires partners, right? It requires working with state parks and land trusts and the public, right, because you have lots of public and lots of very wealthy, influential people living in that area. You really have to understand how, how to navigate that landscape and those partnerships. Uh, and then with that, really reinforce your decision-making with science, right, with really hard science. And the parks have been very good at that, making substantial changes based on science and bringing that to the public and getting the public support and getting local politicians to buy into things like uh, rodenticide bans, right, and building overpasses over the 101 that are $92 million projects. So a really important a partnership park. All right, we're back home, San Diego, Cabrillo National Monuments. And so you'll see there's Cabrillo right in the, the box here, the very southern edge of the state of California and very northern edge of Baja, California. And I worked at the park for, you know, 10 years or so as a you know, field biologist. And, and the thing that – well, the first thing that you notice, right, it's a peninsula, right, surrounded by three sides by water. But it's essentially an island um, because that northern edge is, is completely – it's all development, Right. And there's been a lot of really good research that's already showing that 
when you look at the genetic makeup of species on, on at Cabrillo National Monument, many are more similar to those on the Coronado Islands, which are 15 miles south of Mexican waters, than they are to similar species in the Mission Trails area, right? So it's essentially already becoming an island. Uh, so that's the first thing that really stood out to me. But the other thing is that it has incredible terrestrial and marine resources. And it's a really, it's a small park, which, you know, sometimes is a disadvantage. But in this case, I think it's an advantage because you can really study ecology, especially coastal ecology there, because it's small enough that you can wrap your head around it and have studies that are comprehensive enough that you're starting to really see interaction between marine and terrestrial uh, resources and, and seeing how that plays out in a coastal system. So I think there's a lot of power at Cabrillo to do these types of ecological work. And then just one other thing I want to point out is that, so we're talking about the three parks in Southern California, and you can see the two parks, Santa Monica and Channel Islands in the upper red box, and then you have Cabrillo in the lower red box in part of Baja, California. And while the three parks are in a network, right, and we share similar resources, a lot of overlap in plant communities and wildlife communities and such, we monitor the same way. All our monitoring programs are set up to be identical so that we can look at these species across space. Uh, and we have similar issues, right? Roads and development, fragmentation, right? So those things we have in common. But I, Cabrillo is a, a little bit different. It's, to me, more like Baja California than it is the Santa Monica Mountains and Channel Islands. Uh, and I think that's it's a really interesting place to be. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna, I'll revisit that in a moment. Um, one of the things we do at, to, to understand how do we manage resources, right? We love to count and measure everything, right? We all have our favorite species and we want to know everything about everything, but we just don't have the time, right? Uh, so you have to pick foundational species uh, to, to understand. And these are species that you think how they go, the system you're interested in, that's how it's going to go as well. So first you have to make a really you know, careful choice of, of species, but you know, two, you have, there's a lot of power if you can study one species and understand an entire system. And California mussels is one of those foundational species in the inner tidal. Uh, and that's a species of interest to the park. And here's a healthy bed of, of California mussels, right? If you ever see them, they should be like really extensive and really deep as well. They kind of layer on top of each other. Uh, so that's what you're looking for in a, a really nice uh, mussel bed. Uh, and then this graphic is just to say like, and we, me we monitor that uh, as a as a, a a co various cohort of, of folks up and down the coast, we monitor these mussels in the same way. Uh, and we have lots of partners uh, outside and inside the park service that do this. And, and before we even look at data, you can just see it visually, the story of California mussels and Cabrillo National Monument. So we started monitoring in 1990, all right? And so we we're taking data, but we also take pictures, right? Because we might want to look at these pictures in 20, 30, 50 years, right? And get additional data out of it. Uh, and you can see over here in 1990, you know, it's a pretty solid muscle bed. Uh, but two years later, right, it's almost gone. And then, you know, 11 years later, it is gone. Uh, and then it really hasn't recovered today. There's a handful of muscles in that last image there, but it's essentially gone. And this is the, the looking at it graphically as well. And you can see this decline uh, in, in 1990. And, and so unfor what's unfortunate is that we started our monitoring in 1990, which was at the very sort of end of a huge decline of California mussels across all of Southern California. Uh, and you can see they declined at Cabrillo and they never really came back. They came back elsewhere, but they didn't really come back at Cabrillo. Um, but you can see other things have moved in, different algae, algal species and barnacles have moved in and filled in that space. So it's not barren, right? It's still a, a pretty healthy ecology but you've removed the foundational species now from an area, right? So what happens? And so, yeah, so, you know, the question is like, why do we go from this to this? And, you know, when I, when I pose this question, you know, and it, the first thing many people say is like, it's got to be the water quality, right? Because here's San Diego Bay, definitely not the cleanest of bays, right? And all that ship action and all the ship building and all the chemicals that have been spilled into the bay, could that be the issue, right? I mean, it could be. There's been some work done that's ruled out some of that, but not all of it, for sure, right? So, yeah, if potential. That's that's potential for an issue. Uh, could be climate change, right? We weren't really thinking about climate change so much in 1990, but, like, we are now. Uh, and so, maybe. Um, and one of, the, but one of the things that monitoring is really good at is telling you what is happening. It doesn't necessarily tell you why it's happening. So, that's, that's an important part of this story. Uh, but another important part is, uh, and why we can 
uh, maybe maybe don't have the answer, but we can start look down maybe the right pathway to, towards the answer is, as I mentioned, there is a, there is a series, a cohort of, of folks who measure um, intertidal species up and down the coast from San Diego all the way up to Alaska, and we've just installed the first couple of plots down in um, uh, in Baja California as well, uh, and that's pretty powerful, right? Because you can if you can see what's happening to your mussels here at Cabrillo and at the Navy base and at Cardiff and at Channel Islands and at Olympic, right? That's a lot more powerful than just looking at your muscle population at Cabrillo National Monument. And so here's some data just to kind of give you a sense of, you know, what we see and, and, and is what's driving at least my thinking, right? So starting at Cardiff Beach up at the north, and unfortunately the timelines are a little different. We didn't start at these sites until, you know, the late 90s, so it's seven years later. But you can still see, right, here's muscle cover at Cardiff Beach, right? It's pretty high, and it's, it hangs in there. And then it crashes around 2015, 2016. It scripts here, kind of the same story. It's hanging in there, hanging in there, and then it crashes in 2015. It's recovered a little bit. The Navy base, right, which is right next to, on the Point Loma Peninsula, right, it's pretty low, and it really crashes in the early 2000s and stays low. And then the same story. Here's the Cabrillo data again, right, for the third time, right? Here it is pretty high in 1990, and it crashes and never really comes back. Right, so you can look at those three, three kind of, or, you know, four stories here, right? And to me, right, so you're looking at, you know, you see change in 1990 at Cabrillo. You see change at the Navy base, you know, maybe a decade later. And then you see another decade later change at these two sites farther north, right? And this is just me waving my hands, right? But this is, you know, to me, a, a slow march northward of a changing ecology, Right. We lose them at Cabrillo, and then maybe 10 years later, they go away at the Navy base, and then maybe 10 years later, they start to decline at Scripps and Cardiff, right? To me, like, that's a potential climate change issue, right? Or some, some global driver of change where you see this march northward. And, and that's what we expect with warming oceans, right, and warming waters, is that things are just going to progress northward. And in 2015, 2016, there was a severe marine heat wave which really impacted intertidal ecologies in Southern California. And you saw it there in the muscle data, right? That's when they all declined. It just got really warm in the ocean and things changed. But that we don't, that's kind of all we know. So that, again, that probably is on me to go find researchers who want to study California mussels and help us figure out what is actually happening, right? Why is it changing? But I want to transition now to tell the last story, right? And this is one of my favorite stories. One, because I love Shaw's Agave. I'm just a big Shaw's Agave fan. I'm wearing my cactus shirt tonight. There's probably a Shaw's Agave on, on this. Uh, but I also think it's a great, this, this project is a great example of partnerships and what the RLC can do to uh, support parks and support uh, stewardship in parks. So there's a lot of partners here at the Natural History Museum, uh, partners at the Boss Institute from UC San Diego. And, uh, and I just want to point out all the really awesome photos tonight are from Michael Reedy, who's in the audience. Yeah, exactly. The grainy ones are my iPhone photos, so you can really pick those out pretty easily, I think. Um, so on the on the left here, this is a, a Shaw's Agave, uh, and this this center uh, image here, just one point. This is the California Floristic Province, which runs from kind of this this part of Baja, northern western Baja California all the way up into Oregon. Um, and you know, essentially, that's just grouping all kind of plants that have a similar characteristic together. Uh, but you can see here this this what I've highlighted here into this next box is uh, Southern California, San Diego in particular, and uh, Northwestern Baja. And this this red outline is the the range of Shaw's agave. So you can see it, it nestles in really nicely to the very southern edge of the California floristic province. And it just barely most of the plants uh, occur in Baja California. There's a little tiny bit here in San Diego. And just revisiting Baja, right? I always like to say, like, today's Baja is San Diego's yesterday. Like, anytime I go down to Baja, uh, it just, to me, I'm like, oh, this feels like Cardiff, or this feels like Carrillo National Monument. Like, right here, if you've been to Carrillo, to the Wedding Bluff, Overlook, right? It looks, it kind of looks like that. It's a little more beaten up because everybody walks on it. But that's you know, Punto Colonet in, in Baja, California, right? A lot of similar species, a lot of similar landscapes, but, uh, you know, a, a fraction of the people, Right? So it's, I think it's really an excellent place where we can look into our past and think about what, what California ecology, Southern California ecologies looked like 200, 300 years ago, and we set those reference conditions. Like, this is where we want to go, right? 
But I also think it's important for the future because as climate changes and things are marching northward, right, maybe these ecologies that are in Baja now are going to be our ecologies in 40 or 50 years. So if we can understand what's happening now, maybe we're better prepared for when things change in the future. So I think it's a really important um, uh, research opportunity. So why Shaw's agave? Well, when we started, right, we, they're really charismatic plants. I mean, they have giant stalks and these huge yellow flowers, right? They just, you, they just stand out and just, you, you just get curious about them. And so uh, at the time, Adam Taylor, a good, a good friend and botanist of mine, were, was working in the park, and we were just super curious about Shaw's agave and started digging around the literature, like, okay, what's known about them? Like, how, everyone's like, oh, how long, how long before that stalk comes up? You know, how long do they live? And, like, we couldn't find answers anywhere. Uh, and so you know, this is like a couple week process of like digging around in literature and we can't find anything. And then one day in the mail arrives this from Sula Vanderplank, who we didn't know at the time, but now is a good friend of probably like half the people in this audience as well. Um, a, a conservation plan for Shaw's agave, right? So it was really fortuitous. Like, oh, well, here's all the information that's out there on Shaw's agave delivered to you in your mailbox. Uh, so it was, really, it was really fortuitous, and we just had all this momentum, and so we started going forward. And what we learned right away was, okay, there's three populations in, in Southern California. There's the Torrey Pines population, the Point Loma Peninsula, and the Obora lands. Uh, we know that Torrey Pines was planted. So it was, a, it was documented that they – I don't know where they took the individuals from, but it was planted in the park. So we know it wasn't native to the park. The borderlands population was obliterated uh, when the border wall went up in the early 2000s. So that population is gone. So we're like, oh, so potentially the Point Loma population is the last standing Shaw's agave uh, uh, population in the U.S. And within this document that Sula put together, it's this really awesome photo from the late 1800s. Um, and we're pretty sure that this area is it's like the, the Loma Portal, uh, OB, Sunset Cliffs area, right? And you can see Shaw's agave with stalks. You see dead Shaw's agaves, right? So this is late 1800s. These plants live 50-ish years or so, we think. So when we saw this, we're like, okay, like these, these individuals have been here at least since the early 1800s. Highly doubt Native Americans were moving these things around, right? And like, you know, bringing them from different places. This is probably part of the original population. And this is probably part of the original population that's on the Navy base now. So we were really excited to find this and really kind of gave us the confidence to move forward that, you know, this is a really important species uh, that has a long history in the park and in the area. And at the same time, we found this other interesting article called Moving Day for Agave. Uh, some folks at the California Native Plant Society saw these agave on the Navy base and like, oh, these are these these are important. And, but there's none on the on the National Park Service side. They were all on the Navy base side, and they thought like, yeah, the Navy's protecting them, but who knows how long they're gonna protect them, right? So we better move them on to the Park Service property. Uh, and so they took 28 specimens from the Navy base and planted them throughout the park. But that was all the information we had. We didn't know where they planted them. We didn't know where they got them from exactly. We just know it was from the Navy base to the park. And complicating it is at the northern edge of this range, and it's unique to the, this kind of group, is these, these plants are clonal. So like a single rosette will be you know, formed, and then at some point it'll, it'll form a clone off the bottom and another clone, and that will grow, and they'll form clones. And they just get these giant clonal clumps that form, right? The, you know, 15, 20 different agave in this one one clump, but they're, they're clones. They're, it's essentially one individual. So we didn't know if they found one giant clump and took 28 and spread them out across the park, meaning we had one single agave essentially, or did they take 28 from different 28 different areas, right? They didn't know. So we put all of these things together, right? And we said, okay, well, okay, what, what, are our, what are our questions here? And we came up with four questions. What's the status of Shaw's agave in the park? Uh, are the agave producing viable seed? Who's pollinating the agaves? And what's the genetic diversity of the population in the park? So that first question was actually the easiest because, again, the park is really small, uh, and they're really easy to spot, right? They're pretty big, and especially when they're, they've got a stock, they're really easy to find. And so we just said, here, Adam, here's a GPS unit. Go find everything in the park. Go find every single shell's agave and GPS it and give it a, a name and a number, Right. And so he went around and did that. He GPSed everyone and yeah, did other things like are they individuals, are they clumps, are they flowering, are they not, uh, you know, what's the age group and, you know, or age class. So we had lots of really good data right off the bat. So we kind of solved that one right away. 
The second question was also pretty easy to answer. Are they producing viable seed? And you can see here, here's a seed, uh, a fruit, and it's cracked open, and it's really easy. There's black seeds and white seeds. The black ones are viable, the white are not. So you can really just literally count all the seeds and know what percentage of vi viable seeds in that each fruit. And so we did that. We did a random sample throughout the park um, and found 7% viable seeds. We're like, well, is this, what, is this norm or what? So we all, then we went to Baja and did the same thing. And we found about 20% of the seeds in Baja were viable. So a three, you know, threefold increase in viability. So, but, you know, we're at the northern edge of the range. So maybe this, maybe this species, at, uh, the population at Cabrillo is not quite as viable as, as the, that in the heart of the population in Baja. But, um, but what was encouraging, the 7% of viable seeds we would take to the greenhouse, and we had nearly 100% success rate in, popula in, in growing these in the greenhouse. So we had lots of agave to plant. The third question is the trickiest. So who's pollinating the agaves? Uh, and so this was a lot of work here by Drew Stokes, who's the who's a, a ecologist here at the Natural History Museum. Uh, and Drew set up a lot of these anabat detectors, which are these acoustic bat detectors. Uh, so we really wanted to figure out. And he did a lot of mist netting and some and visual surveys as well. Uh, so um, we think, you know, we thought, or we'd still think it's the, the pollinator should be a, a bat, right? If you look at the structure of an agave flower, particularly this agave flower, it just screams uh, as a nectar feeding bat would be the would be the pollinator, and that's the case in Mexico. You know, it's a case in a lot of places where you have these agaves with the with the same flower structure. So we were pretty confident, like, okay, it's going to be a bat, and we're going to find it, and we're going to be awesome because we're going to figure out who's the who's the one who's, who's pollinating this plant, right? So what we find, uh, so it, this is an old graphic. So at the time, we detected nine different bat species, which was pretty amazing, right? I think it's up to 11 or 12 now. Um, so what we found was like, wow, there's a lot of different bat species using the park. And it was, I think there's 20 species of bats in San Diego County, which is a huge diverse county, as we heard tonight, right? And more than half of them frequent the park. So super huge. Uh, it's a really important resource for bats. But unfortunately, no Mexican long tongue bat. And no known nectar feeding bats are visiting the park. So, all right, swing and a miss, right? Okay, maybe it's not a bat. So we said, all right, Natural History Museum, uh, what else you got? What else can you find out for us? And they said, okay, we're going to have somebody just stake out these agaves and just watch them all day and just see every, every, every species that might visit this, species, this uh, agave, we're going we're gonna to document it. So it was a lot of really hard, intensive field work. Uh, and what we found is, it was like 98% honeybees, lots and lots of honeybees. So we're like, well, maybe, right? And uh, we're like, no, because the problem is the anthers of the agave flower only open at night, and honeybees are only active during the day. All right, so it's probably not honeybees. We're like, well, maybe it's something that's happening at night that we're not seeing. So let's set up camera traps, right? We're going to figure it out this way. Set up all these camera traps. After 150,000 photos, we got one wood rat it was scurrying around on top of the flowers. We're like, maybe, what do you think? Maybe it's getting the pollen on his chest and going. We're like, no, it's, that's a pretty far-fetched story. So, <laughs> so that, that, that question remains unanswered. We're not sure who's, who's pollinating the agave. And the last question, what's the genetic uh, diversity of the population? So this was a partnership with uh, the Boz Institute, which is nested within the UC San Diego uh, school. Uh, and so what we did, we took uh, a, a sample of genetic material from the agaves at Cabrillo. Uh, fortunately, you know, now we're really good buddies with Sula at this point. So we're like, Sula, you got to have some genetic material from Baja, right? She's like, of course I do. Uh, so Sula gave us these uh, samples from uh, 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 just south of Ensenada, uh, which is about halfway down uh, the range, and then, uh, or maybe like a quarter of the way down the range of the species. And then about halfway down, we have samples from Arroyo Hondo. Uh, so it's pretty good spread, pretty geographic spread in, in, in some samples from the heart of the population. And the assumption we're making here is that the, the Baja populations are, are, are pristine, right? They're like the genetic structure of this is probably as good as it gets because these areas are really untouched. There's the, the agave are abundant. They are a keystone foundational species on this landscape, and they're everywhere. So they're doing really well. So our assumption is that the genetic structure that we find in those, are, are, that's the reference. That's where we want to get. I won't do it justice explaining this phylogenetic tree, so I'm going to really simplify it for you. Um, essentially what it is showing is that 
the the structure, the genetic structure of the agaves at Cabrillo mimics what we're finding in Baja. So it's equally diverse as what we're finding in the two populations, which we're presuming are very good, uh, uh, you know, very uh, healthy genetically. So when we got this information, this is really important because we're like, okay, we've got time. Like it, we're, they didn't plant 28 <laughs> clones, right? They actually probably did a really good job and took one from this and one from that and one from there and one from there, right? So we have this really still a good uh, genetic pool to draw from, and that this buys the park time, right? We don't know the pollen areas, but we don't have to worry because, like, we're probably we've probably bought ourselves forty or fifty years to figure out this this uh, question. And so, just kind of looking back on that and recapping, right? So, what's the status? Well, we found lots of adults, but no recruits. All they're all adults. We find nothing, no, no seedlings, no little, no, no little agaves out there. So um, it's interesting. They're producing viable seed. Maybe not as much as in Baja, but they're still producing viable seed. Um, we don't know who's pollinating them, but they are being pollinated because there's viable seed. So we can't figure that out. So something's happening, and the genetic diversity of all the foundation is there. So um, again, we probably need to figure out who the pollinator is, right? If we want to perpetuate this species, you know, 100, 200 years into the future. But we've kind of got time to figure that part out because currently the pool is pretty stable. And kind of summing up that project, I always like to say, right, the, the, it was a great effort by, so it's the National Park Service, the U.S. Navy, Natural History Museum, the Boss Institute, right? It's a really great partnership, right? Um, and all of those folks came together to give the National Park Service an improved understanding of a species, a rare species that we wanted to know more about, right? So very important, right? So made great uh, contribution to the park. We also made contributions to science, right? We've published two papers out of that. Like I said, before we went into this, other than Sula's uh, uh, manifesto on agaves, right, there is nothing out there on, on the species. And now there's data, and now there are papers, right? So now other people in the future who want to study Shaw's agave, have something to base their studies on. And then the power of partnerships, right? There's absolutely no way this, this project comes off just with Park Service funding and staff, right? It required so many, so many different folks to help us out. And so there's a lot of power in that, those partnerships. And then kind of zooming out, right? The same messages, right? The three, think about the three stories we've heard here tonight, right? We, because of what we, our partners and our, and the science we use, right? We have an improved standing uh, understanding of rare species, but also ecologies, right? There's been contributions to science. Seth Riley at Santa Monica Mountains has published over 20 papers on, on uh, Southern California mountain lions, right? And then lastly, and I think this is the most important part, the part that rings really true to me is the power and partnerships, right? All of these projects are done with partners, uh, and there's absolutely no way the Park Service can do this alone, even under the best of conditions with all the money in the world, which we never don't have and we're probably not ever going to have again, right? We can't accomplish this without our partners. Uh, and so that's, to me, one of the most integral roles of the Research Learning Center is to bring these partners in to support the Park Service uh, in their effort to steward, right, for this generation and, and in perpetuity. That's all I have for you tonight. Happy to take questions. And there's a, there's a website. You can check out lots of really cool science communication stuff and lots of great Mike Reedy photos. Uh, there's my email if you want to contact me. And, again, happy to take questions. Thanks. Yeah. We, well, so the question is, do we know what pollinates them in Baja? We, we, we think it's the bat. There's no solid evidence, uh, but there's observation of bats visiting them. Uh, we saw a lot of hawk moths visiting them in Baja. Potential, right? We, didn't, we don't see those at Cabrillo. So. Or see them visiting anyway. We occasionally see them. Uh, one, two, three. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what's the next step in looking at pollinators? Um, I don't think we have one. I wish uh, Drew Stokes was here tonight, but may, Sam and Lauren may, may have an answer for that. Right. 
So yeah, so so Sam was saying, you know, using eDNA, which is environmental DNA. So when a bat flies and it visits a, a flower, right, it leaves a little bit of its spittle and stuff behind, right, in which you can capture and then uh, you can barcode that if it's you know in the barcode database and say like, oh, there's there's DNA from this species. Clearly, it visited it visited this flower. So that that's a, a good potential route, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. I'm sorry. Who's next? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, right, like compacted soils or something, right? Maybe it's not like, you know, getting, yeah. So what I didn't mention was there was also a study done where, so we grew them out in the greenhouse. Patricia grew them out in the greenhouse. Um, and we we plant them. Right, little you know, little sprouts, and they they'd be gone in a couple of days or nibbled down. So clearly, there was like an herbivory issue. And then we started caging some and leaving some uncaged. And sure enough, those in the cages weren't weren't being nibbled down and were persisting. So it could be an issue of herbivory rabbits or you know rodents or something. Right? As soon as it greens up, right, they're nice and leaf, they're nice and like fleshy and moist, right? A perfect little snack for a rodent or a rabbit. So that could be an issue. Yeah, I mean, so without without new material being new genetic material being born, right? Eventually, it's a dead end road, right? Unless they can clone themselves in perpetuity, right? But um, we we think it could be that the cloning because you don't really see it in Baja at all, and the heart they're all single rosettes and then they die, and that's it. Um, we think it could, maybe it's a strategy for being at the very edge of your range, where maybe the conditions quite are quite right. Your pollinator doesn't come every year or every decade, right? You have to wait. So it's a strategy of just like perpetuating yourself for 40 or 50 years by just, you know, cloning yourself until the conditions are just right. And maybe there's this, you know, the right moment where you're pollinated and you have all this viable seed and rabbits don't eat you. All right. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and right, these are, you know, California, it's, it, Southern California is really dry, right? So anytime you were introducing nice, leafy, wet things, right, it's, there's, there's a whole suite of species that is, <laughs> would love to eat those, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's 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 difficult. Um, I mean, so there there are fires that have occurred, you know, not uh, unintentionally, right? So, um, but it, I think the scale and, and John, you may know some of this, but I think this we haven't tried anything just because the scale that we, we need to implement is just even if we can demonstrate success in a ten by ten meter plot to expand that to an island, then five islands is like phew, not happening, right? I don't know, John, has, has TNC thought about that at all?
right? Uh, that like that passive restoration is probably the answer, right? But give you, we need like three to four hundred years, <laughs> right? So, you know, convincing somebody that yeah, just wait three four hundred years, it'll be fine. It's often not a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all trucked up from you know, it's it's barged out, put in the back of a truck, driven up to two, three hours, and then yeah, a water tank emptied into another water tank and then do that again and do that again. So right, so then you see the scale and then it's like, well, this isn't really feasible, right? Uh so then we started trying that direct watering because it requires less water, so that that tank went much farther. And then we got smart and just said, Well, let's try to capture the fog water instead. <laughs> Right, and that's and that's been the most successful. It most closely mimics what the what the plant wants, right? Patricia, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Lauren answer that. Lauren's a real intertidal ecologist. I just play one on TV. And that, that's just sort of like the talking about fragmentation, right? The, you saw the images of muscle beds, right? And when they're healthy, they're con they're just continuous muscles, and they're, it's like deep too, right? There's like five or six muscles stacked on top, on top of each other. And just think about those muscles at the bottom and those heat waves. It's probably nice and cool underneath five other muscles, and there's, you know, hundreds and thousands of muscles around you, right? So it's a really good way to persist through a heat wave. But if you get fragmented, right, and you create like these kind of cuts through through a, a muscle bed, or like they're, they get thinned out in these events, and then another heat wave comes and it gets a little more thin, and another heat wave comes, each one gets progressively worse because there's less cover, right? It's just like the canopy of an, of the oaks, right? When they're all continuous, everything can underneath can probably survive a heat wave, but once you start breaking that canopy and, and allowing heat into it, it changes the dynamics completely. One and two. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really cool project I'm working on uh, with Mike's. Mike's been a big part of this too, of uh, a, a seaweed restoration project. So we think about you know restoring uh, terrestrial species like terrestrial plant species, but thinking about restoring a seaweed. Uh, to an island, uh, and and what's really fascinating to me is so it's it's called rockweed. It's it's again a foundational species, right? It's 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 really important in the earth's tidal and and our colleague Steve Whitaker at uh, Channel Islands has been looking at it. And what he's found is that he thinks that Santa Ana wind events are actually uh, are, are the cause of decline of, of rockweed. So you get these you get Santa Ana winds blowing. And they happen to overlap with a king tide where you get a really, really low tide, right? And and the rockweed, they kind of sit at the upper inner tidal, so they're, they're already exposed. They get exposed a little bit longer than other species in the lower inner tidal. But in those king tides, it's maybe an extra hour or two. And if you you couple that with a Santa Ana wind event over a couple of days, like what he's seeing is there's a really, really high correlation between species decline and areas that are, are directly in these kind of Santa Ana wind funnels. 
so how do you how do you restore that population right uh, and so he's been he's been actually uh, working to to try to figure that out like can you it gets punched out by a Santa Ana wind event can you just go replant that seed weed there um Right. So he's in the midst of his dissertation trying to figure that out. So that's a pretty cool project. And it gets me out to like the Channel Islands for like a week at a time in the most remote part. I mean, I am a little biased, I guess. I'm sorry. Yeah, you had a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not, 1976. It was 1976. Yeah, I, I would imagine like the the security is probably much more lax than than it is now. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Right, just like yeah, physically transporting them, yeah, yeah, you know, and you can do that. Um, that's a that's a really good observation. Uh, we don't really want to do it because, it was, like, lions don't they lions don't like other lions, ex you know, except when it's a big mating season. The lions don't like other lions. So what we don't want to do is, even though we know where they all are, we don't want to take one from an area and drop it into another spot because it immediately may say like, no, no, I want to be back where I was. So now it's going to try to cross the 101 to go back to its, what its home range is, right? Or two, we may not know. We, we, we're good at collaring lions within the park, but if we move them out of the park or move one in, right, we may not know that we may be putting it into another home range and then they'll, they'll end up fighting and one will kill the other. So we'd kind of rather see it happen on its own. Um, but again, the, the freeways really prevent that from happening. So we're, that's why we're really hopeful that this, this overpass will, will be the answer. And and it's why we're, we've been so uh, meticulous about ca getting uh, genetic data from not only lions, but everything. Because what will happen when we have that bridge, if we keep taking the genetic data, we, we want to see that change. We can say, like, see, it works, right? These these overpasses work. We need more overpasses. That will solve the issue. We think that you know, there's a lot of funders out there that really want to see this happen and really think it's an answer. Um, so yeah, I think the genetic data and by taking all that data and then letting things kind of do it on its own is is really what we're we're banking on. Yeah, that's that's a good question. There's, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I, I do know there's a lot of issue with like rodenticide poisoning in the area, right? It's it's a it's a huge issue. Almost every lion. So when we take their blood, we check them for rodenticide, and almost it's almost 100 percent of them, even they they could be completely healthy, have have poison in them, right? Uh, and it's driving a lot of there's a lot of them have mange. A lot of the bobcats end up with mange as well. And we think we don't know why there is why it's happening, but we think it's that they have like a reduced immune system because they have all these poisons in their body to, uh, from birth, right? We have kittens, we test them, and and they are already have the poison in them, and so we think it's driving right these disease outbreaks that have nothing to do with you know a, like a healthy natural lion population, but all because they're susceptible to all sort of denticide poisoning, and and that's something. So like the park service has worked really hard. Right, so there's all these houses, like multi-million dollar houses, and, and very influential people within the Santa Monica Mountains, and that's your consistent constituency, which you need to convince. Like, I know you've got this lovely house, and you don't want rats in your house, but you can't put out rat poisoning. It's a really, it's actually a really hard sell, right? And and we as the Park Service can't advocate for that. We can't go out and say, everyone, you need to take your rat traps out, right? We just can't do that. We have to just present data and tell a really compelling story. And hope that a politician or somebody in that neighborhood, and there's lots of, there's also lots of constituents in that neighborhood that are very pro and pro park service and have been our champion. Uh, and there's, there's now we're just going to see more and more laws passed to ban rodenticides in that area. So it's just, it's a long battle, but we're, we might be getting there.
yeah so it's it's like you have to present it as a scientific argument you know and say like you know here's here's what we're seeing happening to our mountain lions we think it's because it's rodenticide poisoning that's it (laughs) you know we can't say i mean yes you could say like yeah exactly yep and that what's great is there's a lot of land trusts in that area um and and you know they're an ngo and they they can you know then turn to the local you know politicians who can help enact that change so yeah yeah yep 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 yeah we can't even though like like i can sit here and tell you like yeah we need to like ban rodenticides right i as a park service employee i can't really say the message i just here's the science this is what it says Yeah, yeah. I mean, like in like a form like this, we can talk about it. But like, you, like on our website, you know, you can't go to you know Samuel's website and put up like, like we're supporting rodenticide bans. You know, even even though that like it's the National Park Service, right? You would hope that we could say that you really you really can't advocate. No. No, thank you. Yeah, so there's the Channel Islands actually has two sister park agreements, one with Guadalupe uh, Island, which is off the west coast of the Baja Peninsula, and then also with Loreto National Park, which is on the Gulf Coast of the Baja Peninsula. Uh, and there's two formal partnerships. So um, th- those are there's those are they're really sexy in name, but like it, it's pretty minimal. Government to government relations, especially across the border, is super hard. You know, and it depends who the administration is. Some administrations are like you know, yes, this is, we should be collaborating with governments everywhere, you know, to expand our park service reach, you know, in others, it's like, you definitely can't even, you know, call them. <laughs> um, so that makes it difficult, but, uh, I'm also part of, uh, uh, the climate science Alliance and the Baja working group. Uh, and so that's a group that we work on facilitating cross-border science. So, uh, that's a really good, that all the really good hard work is done on these, between like at two NGOs or universities, right. Facilitating those partnerships and, that's something, you know, it, so what's great about my role in the park service is that it's outward facing. Um, a lot of times parks, like you're, you're really thinking about your park and your resources and, and it sort of ends there. And there's even restrictions about like spending government, like park service money on other properties. Like you can't really actually do that. I'm in a kind of a unique position where I, I'm, I'm allowed to engage in these partnerships and even international partnerships. Uh, so I'm really fortunate as part of my role to be part of the Baja working group and sort of facilitate those, those partnerships, uh, across the border through that, through that Avenue. So, yeah, there's a lot of, it's, it's an, it's kind of an emerging field. It's not something that's, um, I mean, it's been done. I mean, Drew Talley was here, uh, earlier. It's been doing it for like 25 years and, you know, John Randall has been doing it for a long time, but we're really trying to formalize it. Right. So that the same people come back year after year and we grow the partnerships and we grow the science and the collaborative projects across the border, because like I said, we can inform each other. Uh, in our science going forward. <clears throat> um, you know, it, it's... It, the scale, like, you know, I, I, th- I think about the folks at Cabrillo laugh, but, you know, when people go to the inner title and see a baby seal and like, oh, it was alone. So I picked it up and brought it to the entrance station. Right. But like, and, and that's, it's horrible. Right. Cause now that seals probably go in the sea world and, you know, and trying to be rehabilitated and may not be in the wild again. And but that's like one individual. So it, it's like in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big issue. Um, so there's that sort of like, you know, silliness that happens, um, you know, people walking off trail, like crushing plants that happens, but like the scale of it is not huge, but you know, I guess over time it happens enough, especially a place like Cabrillo, right. Where even we as scientists have impacts, like we set up, you know, mist net stations to catch birds for five years. And, you know, we put them in these, you know, perfect, you know, habitat, which, you know, there's no trails to it. We're off trail, but we create a trail going to it. Right. And so that trail at Cabrillo is, is even though it's a small, you know, maybe 10 meters and one meter wide, it's not that big a trail, 
now in a scale a park 160 acres that's a big deal actually i mean channel islands is not a big deal to you know create that little footpath but at cabrillo it is so you know that the sort of impact it, it all depends on the scale i think that we that you're dealing with <clears throat> yeah, there is, and you have to you have to think about the scale when you're undertaking these projects. Um, but there, you can take advantage of scale as well. So there's Santa Barbara Island, which is uh, I can't remember how big it is. It's tiny. I mean, it's it's a really tiny island, um, and it, it was grazed as well, right? And so it's heavily impacted. But it's small enough that you can get out there and think like, you know what? If I had like a hundred lanis, I could probably I could turn this place around in like ten years. Right. And so like, again, like Cabrillo is small enough and like Santa Barbara Island is small enough that you can think about an entire ecology and how can you tackle that and convert it. Right. And that's a great test case. Like if you can turn Santa Barbara Island back into a native landscape right now, okay, now you can think about how do I scale it up to, you know, maybe part of Santa Cruz Island, maybe not all of it, but part of it. Right. So I think taking advantage of those smaller scales spaces and, and trying to implement, you know, these, these techniques is, is really where, are you know where we should be focusing yeah all right thanks everyone <laughs>